A lot of people want the whole thing out of the gate and you're not ready for it. And so, you know, 20 years from now, the person that I am going to be will probably crush the person that I am now. I couldn't even buy a $20 lunch and I had to collect my family and leave Taco Bell with my kid in tow. And he's tugging on my hand, asking me why the mean guy went give us our food. Losing everything was the hardest thing I ever went through. I wouldn't change it for the world. I think that's where a lot of people fail is they don't look at themselves in the mirror and go, where are your flaws? Where can you improve? Where did you make mistakes? How could you be better? Today's guest is an entrepreneur who loves making deals, which is probably why he was able to build a thriving real estate investment business twice. You see, the first time he actually messed up so bad that he lost everything to the point where he was so broke that back in 2012, he had to decide whether he was gonna buy groceries for his family or he's gonna have his power shut off at home. Just wait to hear how he turned it all around, what he learned and why he knows now there's no going back. So please help me welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast, Don Costa. What I wanted to start with is, um, you're in real estate and you've, you've seen success, you've seen failure in real estate, you've, you've been on the gamut. We can certainly get into your story, but is there this feeling or perception once you're in real estate that you're fighting everyone else's judgment because people kind of look down on the industry. They look, they, they don't, they don't think it's sexy. They don't think it's real entrepreneurship. They don't think it's, um, you know, any of those things. It's, it's just, you know, get rich, quick shyster type people. Do you, do you feel that? Cause I feel like that exists. Um, you know, I don't feel it. And I say that in one breath and in one breath, I, I guess I do because when I got into podcasting, I've been podcasting for four years. Right. So, um, I was really scared to be labeled a guru. I didn't want to be labeled a guru, but I think that translates into just about any industry. Uh, most of us who haven't come from money and have the surrounding of family and friends that we have that don't have money. When we try to do anything entrepreneurial, I think we get looked down upon, um, and criticized and, uh, cause a lot of families, you know, they're either, you know, judgmental that we're going to be successful and they're not, or they fear for us mm -hmm. in a loving way and have a bad way of articulating it. Right. So, um, from that aspect of it, you know, I think you feel it at every level in, in the real estate industry as a, as a, you know, rehabber, wholesaler, the things we do with the investments, um, I think the only real stigma again is the the guru stigma out there, and I think that translates into into any I think any info. Why, uh, why why are you afraid? Like, why were you afraid to be labeled a guru? It feels I, illegitimate. It feels wrong. What? It feel you know the used car car salesman slam. I don't know. You know, I don't. I don't. I don't. I don't know. It was a valid. Okay. Theory. Is there anything? Something. Is there anything? Is there any difference between someone in in the real estate business and a used car salesman? <laughs> Yeah. Well, it depends on the person. Right. Um, and that's one of the things that, and it, you know, I, I got a chance, you know, I, I've been in, in, in the industry, um, teaching people and coaching people for now a number of years, doing the podcast for a number of years. And I've got to meet a lot of people that, um, that are gurus, I guess, in the space. And they're all really, really good people. Most of them, there are a few of them that are dogs, but most of them are really, really good people just trying to impact lives. And I think where a lot of whether because people will teach Bitcoin and people will teach, um, coaching and people will teach, um, you know, all these different strategies to make money out there. And I think that, um, where people get labeled bad is usually the student, right? The student isn't putting the effort in. They think that they can just show up and have somebody hand them this secret Bible to how to make money overnight. And when they realize that it takes work and effort and commitment, they quit and they blame the guru. And that's, that's where I think 90% of the stigma comes from in any industry when they're, when it's, when it comes to um, coaching and educating people. And now that I've realized that, I think it's, it was an unfounded fear. And the, the reason I, I started by asking that is, um, you know, so I grew up in a family of developers, like, mm -hmm. like, like residential home developers. And, you know, in the sixties, they were building apartments. My grandfather started the company in 1950 with three of his cousins, mm -hmm. but, uh, I've always, you know, it was my grandfather, right? Like, you know, just the greatest generation and mm -hmm. honorable and so respectful and, and a great employer and built a massive business. And then people go like, Oh, developers, right. You know, like you're clearing space, you're making little boxes. They like, they hate, like, it's, right. it's so weird how they hate them. Uh, you know, I've been in marketing for 15 years 
And it's like, I know a lot of good people with the best of intentions. And then when you're talking to someone who's maybe running a, you know, a, a tech startup or something, they're like, Oh, you're in marketing. Is that real entrepreneurship right. in real estate? I've seen this in, in, you know, almost any field. I think we all kind of face this and feel it, but I've heard it the most from people in the real estate industry where they feel like other entrepreneurs don't, don't see what they're doing as as legitimate of a, of a growth plan or an entrepreneurial plan as whatever the right way is to go about it. You know, I, I, I always tell people that I am an entrepreneur first. I've been an entrepreneur since the, as long as I can remember, I, I had a hard time being in a box, right? The clock was a box for me. And, um, you know, I've owned different businesses through the years and I've been successful in some and not successful in others. And real estate was the widget that just kind of fit for me. It's, it's exciting. It fits my ADD. I turn properties quickly, you know, um, I'm not stuck building a factory or a storefront. And so it just fit. And, um, it's still true entrepreneurship. I still run a real business. You know, I have a team, I have employees, I have systems and processes. We have accountability. You know, I know my KPIs, my key performance indicators, you know, the data is very important in my business. It's still a real business. And I think, where the misperception is, is that people think that we're not running it like a real business. And some people probably aren't. Um, but my business is real business. I'm a real entrepreneur. I can take the strategies I use in my business and I can look at any business from a high level and tell you what pieces are missing and what tweaks you need to make to become profitable. And it translates across the board. And um, so I am a real entrepreneur and I don't, I guess I just don't feel it. Right. I don't feel I love the stigma. It. So I, yeah. I love it. <laughs> So if, you know, in terms of the work that you're doing, the, the coaching, the leadership and what have you, what, what is the stigma that, that you're fighting? What's the opposite to your why? Well, I mean, early, early on the stigma was just, just the label. Now I don't care. I think I was scared of having haters. Um, now I don't really care, um, if I have haters, but at the end of the day, um, the, I don't know if I'm fighting a stigma now. Um, you know, the op, my, my why is, is, is to, to impact lives. Like, you know, they talk about generational, um, you know, wealth. I want to create generational wealth. They talk about how you're one or two or three generations from being forgotten though. And I always say that, you know, you can't touch water without making a ripple, right? It's impossible to touch water without making a ripple. There's always an impact negative or positive to anything that you do in the world. And so I want to make that ripple so damn big that even when I've forgotten the impact isn't, and that's where that's my why. So I guess the opposite of my why is not having the ability to reach as many people as I can while I'm here. So, um, that's, that's really, and, and what I'm fighting right now is that what appeals to most people is the Lamborghini flashy, crazy, you know, and that's just not who I am. I drive a Chevy pickup and because oh, I lost everything. Oh, you're yeah. a Chevy guy. <laughs> you don't oh. tell me you're a Ford guy. No, I, I, I'll drive a Ford too, but, uh, <laughs> I own a Ram. I own a Ram because, <laughs> because, I, I can't afford a, uh, uh, I say that I own a Ram because I could, I would, I was not willing to spend the money that Ford has become over the last few years, but, right, right, right. but I could not drive. I've driven Chevys and it's just like oh, the steering box. Anyway, anyway, go yeah. on. But anyway, <laughs> I, you know, I, my, you know, my story is I'd made a lot of money and I was a tool and I didn't run a real business and I lost it all when the economy crashed in 2008 over a period of a few years. Mm -hmm. And I had all the nice stuff. And now, now I just, you know, I live very basic and, um, I'm happy that way. I get to travel. I get to spend time with my family. I get to mastermind with the middle people around the country. You know, I drive a truck. I don't drive a Lamborghini. Um, I go, I rent Lamborghinis that once a year we go to Vegas and we rent, uh, rent high performance cars and we put 300 miles on them in, in, in 24 hours because that's fun. Um, but, um, I'm just not the guy. So that's, that's where I think I'm struggling right now in the info space is just how do I appeal to more people without becoming somebody that I'm not, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, and so with that, that tension, that push pull or what have you, um, how do you, how do you walk that line? Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, I think that my authenticity, authenticity does, does draw people in. Um, I think the more I improve upon myself and, and become a better version of myself, I'll have an opportunity to draw people in without some of the flash. 
Um, you know, I was 304 pounds 18 months ago. Um, I'm 210 today and I'm on my way down to 185. Yeah. So, you know, I, I put my, but but it's one of those things. It's like, you, you, you know, I was, I was broke. I I had a million dollar judgment against me in 2012. I started my business again and I overcame things financially, but then I started putting myself out there and being on stage and being in front of camera and realizing what I look like. Um, and realized that I couldn't be up there telling people how to be successful when I look like uh, I was not successful with my health. So then I made a decision, let's get my health in order. And as I become, I think a better version of myself and who I am is shining through more. I think that that'll give me an opportunity to gain, um, more exposure and hit the right audience. So, you know, pre 08, um, you know, you make a lot of money. You're acting like a tool is what you said. Yeah. Things go that's sideways. The, that's the polite way. That's the polite word. <laughs> well, we're going to, I want to, I want to dig into what those, those periods are. And then, you know, things go sideways and you start to rebuild and you know, you're still, you're still on the rebuild even today, seven years later, whatever it is, you're still on the rebuild. Um, so who was Don in the first, because when I started my company in 2006, I was 23 years old. And so whenever someone asks me a question about entrepreneurship, uh, about running a business, about what I, I, I have to say, well, what period of time? Because I've had like in that time, six different periods that very clearly in my head chunk into like the, the differences in life, the differences in business, the differences in my mindset and what have you. Who were you before 2008 then? I was a guy who came from um, no money. And, uh, a very rough childhood that, you know, and, and, um, wanted, I think I had a chip on my shoulder and wanted to prove something to the world. And, um, I made a lot of money real easy and thought that everything I touched turned to gold. I wasn't a real leader. I wasn't running a real business. Um, the money was going out as fast as it came in. You know, I had multiple, I was opening multiple businesses that I probably had no business opening. Um, and, and where did, where did that, where did that confidence to do that come from? I mean, obviously, um, you know, wins stack, but how did you find yourself in a situation where you're making this easy money really quickly? <laughs> well, <laughs> and, two, and, two, 2004, five and six in, in real estate, um, you could basically, I mean, it was the, the appreciation was ridiculous. You could throw a rock at a house and make money. I, I thought it was cause I was smart and you didn't have to run a real business. The, the thing about the people don't realize about, you know, a good economy versus a bad economy is sometimes these good economies will hide the flaws. And so for instance, I didn't run a real business. I didn't have real systems and processes in place. So for real, have took me a month longer or two months longer than it was supposed to, that was okay because the market hid that issue and I actually made more money. Oh. And so, so, you know, so it wasn't like the additional carrying costs and the additional overruns and everything was actually diminishing profits. No, it wasn't diminishing profits. So, you know, like you said, you know, it, it, it hides, it hides these issues and it creates this false sense of this false confidence that everything I touch turns to gold, that I don't have to pay attention to my business. I don't have to be a real leader. I was a bottleneck in my organization. I didn't have faith in my team. Um, every decision had to go through me. And so everything that you could, that could be wrong in, you know, business in process and system and leadership, I was who I was at the time with this strong belief in my greatness. And when the economy turned, the holes in my ship were so big that there was just nothing I could do, but slowly sink. And, um, that is, it was a huge wake up call. And even, even, you know, through that period of time of losing it, I mean, I went to the gas station with quarters just by a gallon of gas. I had to go to the grocery store, the calculator, my wife would call me from the grocery store crying because her card wouldn't clear and she had a cart full of groceries. Um, you know, Christmas not being able to get the, the gifts my kids wanted and then certain they were going to be under the tree. How did you not you know? how, how, like, how did you not blame yourself for like, how did you not just live with guilt every day for putting your team, putting yourself, putting your wife, putting everyone through this? Well, because, um, it, I think as entrepreneurs, we have this disease, right. That, uh, everything, you know, will bounce off of us that we can, we can survive anything. And there, you know, I, I would, um, I would, you know, I was proud of myself for us. And I always say, you know, I was hustling. I was hustling. You can't be, 
you, 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 you broke mindset as a hustler mindset. You can't be wealthy. You can't make money and be a hustler. Um, I think, uh, you know, some, that's a contradiction to what some people say, but it's, it's true when you're hustling, trying to keep your lights on. And when you're hustling, dealing with the small little things, the problems through the day, you're not focused on the big picture of success. And I was in survival mode, focused on those small little things. And my whole thing was just holding it together um, and not losing my home that was in and out of foreclosure, you know? Um, but there were moments like, you know, going to talk about with my family, thinking that I had enough money on a credit card to buy lunch and I couldn't even buy a $20 lunch. And I had to collect my family and leave Taco Bell with my kid in tow. And he's tugging on my hand, asking me why the mean guy went give us our food. You know, moments like that are the wake up calls. I think for a lot of us where we realize we're fooling ourselves and we're failing the people around us. And, um, but even then it took several of those moments uh, for me to finally look in the mirror and say, okay, you're failing. Um, you can't get a job. No one's going to hire you. What are you good at? You know, and I was good at making deals happen. I, I, I could identify a deal. I could put it together. I could put the people in place, but I was super scared because I thought real estate failed me. Now I look back on it and I realized that I had failed me, um, you know, but it kind of took, you know, it takes, it takes time and reflection. I think that's where a lot of people fail is they don't look at themselves in the mirror and go, you know, what, where are your flaws? Where can you improve? Where did you make mistakes? How could you be better? And, uh, where are your strengths? How could you improve those? You know? Um, and I, you know, I had the opportunity to do that. And so I losing everything was the hardest thing I ever went through. I wouldn't change it for the world. It's made me a better leader, human father uh, across the board. Uh, but it was definitely for a long time, it was a struggle of me just being too stupid to look in the mirror. Hmm. Looking back on it now, do you, and maybe you don't, I, I struggle with this a lot. I, again, I started my business when I was 23, built it up and then spent the last five, six years kind of deconstructing it through this pivot that has taken way longer than I thought it would. Um, and I've watched what I've built, um, really contract and shrink quite a bit. Now I'm smarter and stronger and, and better off today than I was a bunch of years ago when I was kind of blissfully ignorant, mm -hmm. but man, do, does it bother me that I've wasted? I like, I, it wasn't wasted lesson learned but wasted. I wasted this time. When you think about all of the stuff that was happening pre-08 and then all the stuff from 08 to 12, and then all the stuff since then, does it not bother you that it took you so long to figure this out? Do you know, do we all wish that things would have been different, um, that we'd have been different people? Um, I think we all have those moments. I, it would be foolish for me to think that um, I could have not went through, I went through and be who I am today and being able to accomplish what I have today. I'm able to save and serve businesses in a way um, from my experience that I wouldn't have been able to, you know, pre losing everything. So um, as I think as human beings, we have those, Oh, you know, I wasted this time or I should have known yeah, if I could go back in time. Right. But, but the reality is you can't. And most of us who are entrepreneurs are supposed to be real. We don't come from money. Uh, we don't have business experience. There isn't a school that teaches us what we need to know to be a leader. And um, it generally it's not in our DNA. It's something that just has to be beat into us with life experience. And the reason why most people aren't successful entrepreneurs, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say most people, there are a lot of them, but there aren't a lot more is because most people aren't willing to take the beating. And, um, you know, and that's just, that's just the reality. And, and so, you know, life has molded me into who I am. And it is, I'm better for it. And I don't regret that. I don't, I can't change that. And I don't want to change that because honestly, I don't want to be the tool I was, you know, and again, that's the polite word, uh, before I was an arrogant, foolish human being, and I wasn't grateful. I didn't have gratitude for the things that mattered and God forbid, I'm still that person today, you know? So I, I don't have any regrets. But do you not think that in 10 or 20 years, you'll look back on, you know, 2020 version of yourself and say, what a tool. <laughs> and then how do you get in front of that? Do you ever play those mind games? Not so much. No. Cause I'm caught now. I'm just trying to better myself as you know, I'm, I'm surrounding myself with the right people. I'm, I'm, I'm in mastermind communities. I'm, I'm educating myself. I'm, um, you know, I'm trying to, like I said, get healthy and be a better human being, um, in those ways. Um, I'm tackling the things that, that the, the fears that I have that are going to cause me regrets later. So, um, it's just part of the journey. Right. And that's, that's the reality, you know, it's who, who I am in 20 years better be, 
a better person than I am today. I mean, that's, that's the journey we're on in life. And, and you can't, again, you can't change that. I wish I could fast forward, but you know, I, I talk about this all the time. If I just went back eight years and I put the, 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 the amount of stress or, you know, business or, you know, knowledge and, and stuff on my shoulders, just eight years ago, I'd have crushed myself. The stuff that the advancements I've made as a person, as a leader, as a business owner in eight years, if I go back 10 years, right, you, you, you can't, you know, a lot of people want the whole thing out of the gate and you're not ready for it. And so, you know, 20 years from now, the person that I am going to be will probably crush the person that I am now. And that's just, that's just the practical reality. That's, so that's true. how I see it. Yeah. That's so true. You know, I've, um, uh, I put someone, I, I moved someone on my team from, from being kind of mid-level to being the COO. Mm-hmm. And it was a, it, they, they had the right heart. They worked their butts off, but it was a very bumpy transaction for them. And I said, listen, you got to take the pressure off yourself because basically I grew up with my company, right? I grew up with my kids too, right? My oldest is 14. I have four kids. Uh, I'm probably not ready to be the father of a 21 year old yet. But when my daughter's 21, I'll probably be ready. Um, so I hand my COO this, you know, 13 year old business with, you know, not a ton of entrepreneurial background or anything like that. And then, and then it's, of course he's not like, he didn't grow up with the company. He didn't grow up with it. So, you know, I had never even thought of adding that perspective to my own journey because, um, really I spent so much time beating myself up for like, Oh man, like, like I'm embarrassed. I'm like, I I'm embarrassed by things I've done or things I've said or things that I thought were a good idea at the time. Um, I I've never thought of the fact that even if I could play with time and fast forward, that I just wouldn't be ready to carry the weight of that. You're not, you're, we're, none of us are. And, and that's, that's just a practical reality. And that's, I think that's what gives me peace because otherwise <laughs> it'd be a whole different story. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's super cool. So when you talk about the success that you have now, and this is the, this is the fine line that I was talking about. Cool. You, you know, you fly to Vegas, you, you rent the Lamborghini, you have a fun weekend, but you drive the pickup truck. Um, I, I struggle with this, um, you know, first of all, almost everyone in my life thinks that I'm far more wealthy than I really am only because I actually hang out with, pr- with pretty wealthy people, but it doesn't mean that I have any of that kind of wealth. And so, um, uh, there's always like this balance of like me wanting to not be a pretender and really project who I really am or this or that. But also, you know, you do have to show a little, like, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're cutting deals, you're working with these great people. How do you hold that authenticity and that, and that truth to who you are while still showing that? And then honestly, when you say like, you're, you know, where you are in terms of success, are you even close to where you plan to be, where you want to be in, in your own business in your own life? That's, that's, yeah, that's a loaded question. I don't think any of us are ever close. I think all of us, all of us, when we get to the point, we think we want to be at, we want more. Right. I mean, that's just, you know, one of the, one of the things that I've come to terms with and then I'll answer the other part of the question is that I am born and bred entrepreneur. Like some people, they get into entrepreneurship because they want to work from a laptop at the beach. Some people, they get into it because they want to retire early. I will literally build businesses until the day I drop dead. I love building businesses. It's my hobby. It's my passion. It's the pastime. My businesses and my family. So if I'm not doing something business wise or helping somebody in their business, then I'm spending time with my family at the beach or camping or Disneyland or whatever. So that is just coming to terms with who I am and what I'm going to do as an entrepreneur. So I'm always going to want more. Um, Although knowing what the end goal is, you don't create a prison is very important. And that's something that uh, I think a lot of people fail to do is they will, they'll, they'll think they want what someone else has and they'll end up creating a prison. So at least I always have a, an articulated vision when I start a project. So I don't end up with something I hate. Hold on. There's something there though, because yeah. that's actually a huge fear that I have is I, I, I know, I know what I want, but I don't know if when I get what I want, I will want it. Right. So it's a classic, like, I want to be a doctor when you're growing up. Right. I didn't do this, but you want to be a doctor and then you hustle and hustle and hustle. And then you go through med school and then you get there and you realize I hate this. (laughs) So I don't want to be a doctor anymore. And it's like, so a a lot of my own goals are goals that I know I want. I know I want so badly, but then secretly I fear maybe when I get it, I'll actually hate it and create a prison for myself. 
I mean, is that, I mean, is that fear of success? Is that, is that your, your voice telling you something, you know, holding you back from, you know, throwing challenges in the way to keep you from doing what you need to do? I mean, you, you gotta, you gotta look in anybody who has that has to look inside and say, is this an excuse for me not taking action or is this a legitimate fear? You know? And, um, you know, I think it's going to be different for everybody in every situation. So, um, I don't know. That's what I got on that. Now on the imposter syndrome, you just talked about, you know, um, I think we all feel that at any level, you know, I'm, I'm sitting in a room with, with people that I know my business is better than, and I still feel like an imposter all the time. I think that's just a disease that we as human beings have. And that voice in our head that tells us we're not good enough, strong enough, fast enough is always there. It changes, um, at any level. Um, but it's always there and it's never going to go away. And we all have it. You know, when I put out the podcast, you know, it took me six months to do it because the voice in my head was like, is it going to be good enough? You know? And you know, when I get on stage every single time, the voice in my head does that to me. Um, so it's just a matter of, you know, at this point in time is understanding for me is knowing that everybody suffers from it. And, uh, my value is just, just as strong as anybody, whether they have more money or less than me. And, uh, I'm going to bring my value and those who want it will, will eat it up. And those who don't won't. Hmm. And so that's literally just what you tell yourself. You're standing there on the stage. You're, they're calling you, you know, you're, you're doing whatever you're doing, getting, getting yourself pumped up or Tony Robbins style, you know, you're making your move, whatever it might be. Yeah. <laughs> and, and you, you, what, what are the words that you say to yourself in that moment? If you do that, somebody, you know, the, the two things that somebody said to me that really stuck and it's, it goes through my head every time is, you know, if you had, could have the opportunity to talk to you 20 years ago, what would you need to hear? And so I try to make sure that I'm saying something that, that I would need to hear. And then another thing that somebody said to me was, um, there's always one person in the audience that needs your message. And that's all your, that's the only person you're speaking to is that one person needs your message. And so when I take this big, you know, audience and I whittle it down to that one person that needs to hear my message, it's, it's not such a big scary thing anymore. Right. Um, so you know, and we always try to take things on, right? Like we always, as entrepreneurs, want to eat the whole elephant. You can't, like we, we need to buy it at a time. And so I've learned my nature is still, I mean, right now, if I go to a project, I want to eat the whole elephant. I have to remind myself one bite at a time. And it's the same thing. You get on stage, you get on a podcast. It's one bite at a time. Who needs to hear the message that you have? And um, there's going to be one person at a minimum that audience needs to hear it and focus on that one person. And that takes a lot of the anxiety away from me. Um, you know, and and realizing, I think, I, like I was terrified of public speaking. Don't get me wrong. I was terrified of this microphone. Um, I must have recorded 20 episodes of my podcast. It'll never air. Um, you know, oh, you should release yeah. them. You should yeah. release them. Nah, getting on yeah. stage was horrifying. Bonus, um, bonus episodes. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, but uh, they might be funny. But, uh, but anyway, getting on stage was terrifying. I mean, but it was just a matter of. I made a decision to do something and I was going to do it and, and being able to focus in on, on again, the one or one or two people need to hear the message started to make it easier. I remember being on stage two years ago and um, the worst thing happened. My slide deck was wrong and they had an old slide deck. I had sent them the update. They didn't update it. And I had to stand there on stage and ask him to change out the slide deck. So I had like a five minute window oh. to <sighs> fill. Right. <laughs> And, um, and I just said, Hey, you know, there was a point I told the audience, there's a point where just being on stage would have terrified me in this moment right here would have absolutely crushed me. And one of the people in the audience said, what'd you do to get over it? And my response, which is true is I just did it. I just did it. I took action. I just did it. And, um, they ended up posting later how profound that was. Um, but, um, which I didn't think it was, but I guess it was. But anyway, the, the long and the short of it is realizing that to be an authentic and tell, you know, being honest with the audience, telling my story about everything I went through, losing money and the hardships I had, realizing how much those things resonate with people really empower me more and more to do it more. It, it, it excites me to do it more, um, you know, and just again, realizing the world is either gone through or going through something very similar to my struggles or my current struggles. Um, it has, it has allowed me, I think, some strength in putting myself out there and trying to help people get where they need to go. Hmm. That's amazing. So, so one thing that I really, you know, in terms of your, your story, um, I was just like, 
this man's got it figured out. You use different words than than I use, but um, can you share, I guess, just the importance of the, the the idea of as if? Yeah, absolutely. So everybody knows fake it till you make it, right? And and that is not what as if is, but um, it, it it is it's a similar concept. So when I was broke and I had a million dollar judgment against me and I had no business feeling like I was going to be successful in business, I looked in the mirror and took an account of accountability, uh, you know, kind of concept of what, 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 who I was, what I had, what strengths I had and what I was going to do. And I acted as if I was successful. I was the person that I was going to become. And I went out in the world and I owned that value. I owned that strength. And, um, again, it's not fake it till you make it. I wasn't pretending I was owning my strength, you know, I was owning my value. And every one of us has value um, that we bring into the world, you know, for in, in my world, talking to a seller or talking to a private money lender, people will be scared to do those things. I walk into the room and I understand my value is equal. You know, you're a successful business owner. I'm a successful business owner. We have equal value. I have no reason to fear having a conversation with you. We can sit and have a conversation. Our value may be different and you may not need my value, but I have equal value and realizing that and owning that and acting as if I already am who I want to become allowed me to have the right mindset and the right confidence to go out into the world and become that person. I love that so much. You know, I've, i there, there are two moments in my career, let's say, um, where I had these types of light bulb moments. So one, uh, gosh, maybe go back eight years, 10 years, so I'm in my you know twenties and I get a call from, from someone who's not even a client. I get a call from someone who says, Hey Mark, I want you to come in to my office and meet with me and my partners. Um, I think, okay, great. So we set up a meeting and I go down there and this man is in his maybe fifties or sixties. Uh, he has been, you know, the, the, the CMO, the chief marketing officer for like, you know, our largest breweries, like tons, startups, tons of companies, all this stuff. And it's him and his partners, like just a room full of people. <laughs> and I'm thinking, and I'm like, you know, I'm not usually bothered by things I present. I do strategy. I talk about all those things, but I'm just like, these guys have 20 or 30 years on me. Um, they've been doing this forever. Like what, like, what am I going to possibly help them with? And then he holds up this white paper that I'd written that was talking about strategy. And he says, I don't expect this from you. I expect this from us. I don't expect this from you. And then he starts to like ask really penetrating questions. And at a certain point in the meeting, I go, I think to myself, oh, these guys don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> like they do up here, you know, right. for this deep in their career, for this much experience, they, they are way ahead of me. But when it comes to the actual tactical things of what was happening in whatever year it was, 2013, like what's actually happening today that will work or won't work, they have no idea. There's just, there's, and I'm like, oh, I, I have way more experience than they do in this little slice right. based off of who I am and where I am. And it was just like, that was a light bulb to me. But what I haven't done, and because I remember it, and it's just like I can I can call on that when I need to sometimes to say, okay, listen, they're going to do tons of things better than me. But on this one thing, I've got this one thing. Trust me, I've got this. But what I don't do is what I think you're saying, which is to look at way more areas to decide who is the person that I need to be in this moment. Mm -hmm. And then and then slip that on and become that person. Is that is that as far as you were taking it? To a, to a large degree. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, that kind of goes twofold. I mean, in, in, you know, in, in those type of situations, just, just accepting that, that you have value to bring in, into the situation. They have value to bring to situation and you're, they're not better than you and you're not better than them. That's, that's kind of one concept in the, as if though. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's slipping on who you're going to become. It's owning that it's, it's being confident. I, I was going to be a successful real estate investor. So I walked out my door and told everybody, Hey, I'm going to be doing this. This is what I'm going to do. And this is, this is, you know, I'm going to be this person and you can come with me for the ride. And, um, and, and I wore that, I owned it and I became that person, you know, and each step of the way, you know, there's things that I want to do now and I'm just owning it. You know, I am, you know, successful, um, in my business, in this business, I'm going into a whole different arena and, uh, you know, in that arena, I'm not the high level player, but I know that I'm going to be. So I walk out there knowing that I'm going to be a high level player and anybody I run into better, I just accept that I'm going to be right there with them. <laughs> 
know. You're giving me goosebumps, man. And right. it's only it's only because so, so this podcast is called We Do Hard Things. Right. Because I about maybe a year or two ago was really struggling in some areas, and my friend Evan Carmichael was like, "You're Mark Drager. You do hard things." And I was like, "Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, sometimes I can. I don't know." And, and then every time I would be like, "Ah, oh, but I don't know." He's like, "He's like, but why?" I'm like, "Well, oh, but it's really." He's like, "You're Mark Drager. You do hard things. You're Mark Drager. You do hard things. You're Mark Drager. You do hard things." And so, so it's like, okay. And then I would start to face challenges. But I'm, I'm, I'm Mark Drager. I do hard things, mm -hmm. right? And then my kids have started saying, "We're Dragers. We do hard things." And so, I, I know that it works because it's worked for me and yet the thing that gets me more than anything is when i say i'm mark trigger i do hard things and then in the back of my mind that little voice of doubt goes like mm -hmm. do you really right so you know you're going to be successful in real estate mm -hmm. you know you're going to be just give just give me enough time i'm going to be successful in real estate but in the back of your mind it goes are you though didn't you just screw up really big you know like are you? We, all, we all have that voice. Every single one right. of us. So how do voice. you, how do you, how did you not have that stop you? And how do you not have that stop you even today? Because I have realized that if I want something, the only way to get it is to take massive and perfect action. That the voice is going to be there. The doubt's going to be there. That I don't know what perfect looks like. That I don't know what the other side looks like. Literally, I made a change in my company in 2018. And I hired somebody. And I sat down with her and I went, you know, here is where we are and here is where I want to be. And I have no idea what the middle looks like, but we're going to figure it out together. And that is just how I operate at this point in time. I throw it against the wall. I figure out where the cracks are and I fill the cracks in. And um, I've accepted that that's one of my superpowers and that's who I am. And that allows me to push through that voice. I'm all, that voice is always going to be there. I sat in a room this last week, um, you know, in a mastermind group where I, I was like, you know, am I an imposter? Do I belong in this room? And by all intents and purposes, I do. I have a, as good or better business than just about everybody in that room. So, um, it's just something that I've real, you know, so many people that are entrepreneurs, they want to know what perfect looks like before they take action. They want to know, explain every little detail to me. And I can pour every bit of knowledge I have into you, but until you actually physically and mentally experience it, you really don't know how it applies. And I've realized that. And so that doubt's going to be there until I prove that doubt wrong. It's my job to prove that doubt wrong. And I walk into everything with massive and perfect action. I know that I will figure it out and, and I will prove that doubt wrong. Massive, imperfect, imperfect action. action. I like it. Do you think that, and I'm split on this because I talk to people who, who fall on either side. Do you think that everyone is cut out to be an entrepreneur? I don't know. I, I really don't. I think that there, you know, there are some people that um, are just more comfortable being a cog in a wheel and that is where their happy place is. Um, I think that most people want a better life. They want something different and they, they all deserve that opportunity to work towards that, but that may look different for each one of us. Maybe you're entrepreneurial, but you're not an entrepreneur and you, you, you find an organization that allows you to feed what you love and, and become, you know, who you need to be in your life. So, um, but then there's people that are, I mean, you got you know, you, you have all these personality tests, right? You got the high C's, which are the con high conservative people. They like number crunching. They want security. They don't want risk. Then you got the guy like me who will literally jump off the cliff and build the airplane on the way down. I'm just built for risk. I'm built for entrepreneurship. And then they're the, they're the people in the middle. And, um, and I don't think everybody's built for entrepreneurship. I, I do believe that they, if they want it bad enough, that they can have it. I've known people that are, you know, the, this test is one that you will throw out there. They are a high C, low D, right? Um, they, I always say that desire trumps the disc. If you want it bad enough, you can, you can accomplish things outside your comfort zone, but you're going to have to want to be uncomfortable. And uh, most people don't want it bad enough. And that's where the differentiating factor is. Some of us are built for it. Some of us are not. We all have obstacles to overcome. How bad do you want to overcome those obstacles? So and, what, uh, what are the must have things then in your mind? Cause obviously everybody's path is different. Yeah. Like all of so great. So I, I get all of that stuff out of the way. So no one picks this question apart, but um, what are the things that you think that someone should have that would help them uh, achieve success as an entrepreneur? You got to want it bad enough. You, you, it's gotta be something that. You, you but, just, but so here's here, but here's the thing in that, in that answer, right? So wanting to build something greater than yourself, wanting the financial freedom, wanting, um, 
uh, to just be an entrepreneur and make sure that it works to have the team, like, like what aspect of the want and the desire is the thing that actually pulls people through the most? That, that, that is a great question. And, you know, as, as, uh, you know, people who are trying to help people start businesses or want to be entrepreneurs or, or coach them in their businesses, we're not supposed to tell people that things are hard, but the reality, is <laughs> you're not, you're not, but really? the is that, is, where, where is that a rule? What are you talking apparently, about? Apparently because people don't buy hard, right? They buy glamour and glitz. Oh, but, uh, you're yeah. talking about, you're talking about all of the thought leadership funnels. The thought, and all yeah, the yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, no, it's not hard. Listen, I no. will spoon feed you. Uh step by step, everything that you need to succeed. Right. Right. So, but the reality is entrepreneurship is hard. Um, you have those voices, you have the doubt, you have your family and friends to overcome. You have the obstacles of the things you don't know to overcome. And the reality is that sometimes even when you, you know, if you've never had money and then you make money, that can be hard and um, how to manage it. Who's taking advantage of you? You know, what friends do you stay friends with? Because some friends just aren't going to come with you. And so there, when I say that you got to want it bad enough, it's like, you got to want to overcome the obstacles that are going to be, that life is going to put you in your way to test you, to make sure you're, sh- make sure you're sure you really want it and you're sure you deserve it. And, um, some people just aren't cut out for that. Yeah. And, you know, and, and that's, that's really where the differentiating factor is, you know, there's people with my personality trait that they are willing to take risks, but they're still not going to be entrepreneurs, you know, because they're not willing to do the work. And, um, that commitment, that tenacity, that drive to make something happen, that desire to build something, not just to have a better life. We all want to have a better life, but that tenacity to overcome challenges and obstacles. Um, that's something that you either need to have born and bred in you, or you need to be willing to cultivate and make a part of you. And I think that's really the differentiating factor. Hmm. And so combining a whole bunch of things that we just talked about. So you're standing in the mirror and you're looking at yourself and you're plainly saying, these are my strengths, these are my superpowers, these are my weaknesses, this is my as if, so I'm gonna go out and do this. How did you, like, like walk me through how you actually painted that picture of whatever that was, the as if, what, how did you paint that picture? Because I find myself, you know, I'm coming out of a season now where I've spent probably two years trying to really figure out much more about myself and, and what I'm capable of and all these things. And so I only actually have a picture of like the next three to six months. And so I'm, I've spent the last six weeks even doing this, like, Oh, you know what? I probably would be very good in this situation as this type of leader with this type of team, with this type of structure, with whatever. But I'm at a period now where I'm, I need, I'm ready to paint the picture of my as if version of myself. How did you go about that? I don't, I don't know that it's as much of um, a, a fundamental of the, the, the goal that I have as much as it was who I needed to be to accomplish the life I wanted to have. Mm-hmm. And I think it, it's bigger than just, um, it's like, like when you're in survival mode, you're paying attention to the little pebbles before you. And if you just looked up and saw that one big obstacle that you pushed over, you'd experience great success. Right. Um, but everybody's too busy worried about the pebbles, the lights, the bills, the this, that, um, it's kind of the same thing. It's, it's focusing on like, who's the man or woman that I need to be, to have the things I want. What's, what, what is my confidence level and who I am need to be? Um, you know, what, what, what strengths do I need to cultivate? Um, what belief systems do I need to have? Who, who are the people that I need to be associating myself with? Did you with? just roll this around in your head? Did you do this through prayer or meditation? Did you write a journal? Did you like, did you start clipping whatever <laughs> images? Of, right. You know, like when I, I, I lost some weight too. And when I lost the day I decided to lose weight, I grabbed a photo and I said, this person kind of looks like what I look like now. This person looks like who I want to be. I have a visualization of where I'm going for then. But, but how did you actually make that something that didn't disappear just as a thought exercise for me, it's in my head. So I got a weird, like I can remember crazy things. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't take notes. I'm one of those people that don't take notes, but not that my memory is the greatest, just certain things that, you know, I can really retain. And for me, vision is one of those things. If I say I'm going to do something, it's like I've magically put it in motion and it's going to happen. If I say I'm going to accomplish this goal and that goes bad or good. If, if I, if I let doubt creep in and I start saying, Oh God, what if it goes bad? 
then suddenly the trajectory of whatever I'm doing starts to go bad. I have to be cognizant of that and keep my mind straight. Some people, they need the vision board. Some people need to write it down. Um, I'm one of those weird ones. If I, if I, if I speak into existence, it becomes existent. It exists. And, um, and that's for me, it works. This is, this is what I want. This is who I need to be. This is where I'm going to go. And I just go, I just go. And it's like, I, I'm teaching my son to drive right now. You know, and a lot of people will look between the lines and they'll try to keep the car steady. And I always tell him, look ahead, find something ahead and your hands will take the car where it needs to go. Yep. And um, it's kind of the same thing. I just look ahead and I pick a point and I'm like, who do I need to be to be at that point? And that's who I'm going to become. And I own that and I go with it. And it's not perfect. It's imperfect. And I know that going through that and I figure it out as I go and I'm okay with that. And me being okay with that allows me to accomplish some really cool things. And the idea of the imperfect action though, to me, the imperfect action is always going to cause all of these tension and challenges and opportunities, you know, you can learn, but, um, and at the same time, that seems very similar to me as the pebbles, right? You're too busy focused on the pebbles. Everyone's too busy, but we're focused on the pebbles because either you're going to, I mean, I mean, while you're, while you're busy looking up at that next obstacle, you have to be willing to let the pebbles fail. Mm Mm-hmm. So how do you, how how do you get through, whether this is business or life or whatever, how do you get through that tension of like, oh, um, not only do I have to hurt my perfectionistic traits, not only do I need to start looking up now, I need to be willing to let what's happening today and for this week or for this next quarter or for even the year to go to hell so that way eventually it will pay off. It's like, that's, that's why we focus on the pebbles. No. Well, if you focus on the right things, the pebbles will take care of themselves. They don't just, they, they, you don't just let them fail. I mean, if you, if I accomplish, like my thing was I needed to earn money. I was literally sitting in a meeting with an investor because I was trying to rehab homes and uh, right out of the gate with no money. And I was sitting trying to get this guy to back me on a deal. And my wife texts me right in that meeting that my water had been shut off. I had a choice. I can go home with my tail between my legs or I could sit in that meeting and close that guy. And I sat in that meeting and closed that guy. It was a decision. And then I went home and handled my water, but I had gotten the money to put myself in motion to make money. So it's, you have those moments where you have those choices. Do I, do I sink into this moment and go hide or do I continue on my path and then fix what, what's already broken, you know, once I get whatever I need to get. And that's, you know, hopefully that's a story that resonates. Um, once, but would, but once, would old you, but would old you have rushed off to fix the water right away? I didn't rush off to fix the water. Right no, away. I know you didn't. I'm saying, yeah. I'm saying, okay, great. You're in Before that, that, you pre, need that money pre you tool version of you. Would you have rushed off to fix it? Maybe nah, not tool version, but probably pre tool version. Maybe possibly. Um, it's, because it's because the, what I, what I hear and what I feel is like, great. Now you're coming home. You're, 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 you know, your friends know that you can't pay the water bill. You don't have the water sorted out. Um, your wife is mad at you. You know, everyone would judge you. You, you went, you went off to take a meeting with someone and ignored the text of your wife that you have no water. Like whether it's real or not, this is what's going through my head. And, and it, so that decision to stay there, that decision to stay focused, big picture, people would applaud you and make sense. But in the moment, everyone would judge you for that. No, it's possible, but does it matter? That moment's what got me where I am today. That one decision not to run has got me where I am today. It got me, they got me the money to get the first deal back in the game in June two, in 2012. I made 10 grand off that deal. We made 20 grand. I had to split it with the guy. I got 10 grand off that deal. I was back in the game. And had I not honored that commitment and saw it through, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now necessarily. I, I might've found a way to overcome it, but those moments gave me more strength. And, um, and there's, there's many moments like that where I had, you know, hard choices to make. And, and I chose to make the hard choices because of who I was and who I wanted to be. And it's not easy. I, I make it sound easy. It's not easy. You're right. People are judging. Now I had an advantage. I had flipped houses before and I knew how to turn my water back on. And it was a Friday and I knew I wasn't going to get caught. So I <laughs> turned my <laughs> just, water back you on. You go out to the curve. But, yeah, I did. <laughs> turn it back on. That's a whole different, that's a whole different story. Uh, but um statute of limitations you can't come after them water department <laughs> it was it's just a fine for doing it but um 
but it was like that decision put me back in the game. You know, I was, I was slumped in my couch in depression in, my, in a chair and I decided to put an ad on Craigslist and that ad on Craigslist led to that meeting. It's like little decisions you make put you on a path and you, you got to commit to that path. And, and no matter how hard it, and it wasn't easy. I mean, don't get me wrong. I got 10 grand off that deal and it was gone before I got it. You know, it was, it was just, you know, I still was broke. I still had to go back to work and, um, it's just, it's a choice. You know, I always, when I'm, I'm doing a presentation, I talk about the weight loss, right? I always say it was, it was a, it was a decision. It was, it was, it was a choice, not surgery, right? Because it was a choice to lose the weight. Was it easy? No, it was one pound at a time. You've been through it, right? One pound at a time. And it wasn't easy. And it, it was a commitment to a cause and you, you just have to do it. And looking up now, you know, sometime later, I'm 90 pounds down and it was so worth it. But during, during the moments when I had people saying, you know, well, let's go out and do this. Let's go out and eat. Let's go out and drink. My wife was like, you're eating different than the whole family and blah, blah, blah. I mean, there were those moments and it wasn't easy. Um, but man, it's worth it. You know, and, and, you know, and my, my, my wife is now, she's looking at me and she's like, you know, holy crap, you're like a whole different person, you know, um, it's worth it. And, um, I don't, I don't know, man. I just, so many people fail to realize, I think that, uh, you know, getting there and doing the work pays off and, uh, and seeing it through even when it's hard pays off. And that's, that's the differentiating factor, I think, between successful athletes, successful business people, successful people that are become actors or actresses is they're willing to go through hell to crawl through the mud, to have what they want come thick or thin hell or high water. And they make it happen. They will it into existence. I just, I just need, I just need a moment to take that all in, man. That's there's so much truth in what you just said. I almost feel like if I, if I follow up with another sharp question right away, just like, like what you just said, not only will be pulled and clipped, but, but it's, um, it's what we all have to do. We all have to be comfortable being selfish enough to put our future self first 100 and uh the reason why i i have to pause so much after you say that is is it's just like ah uh, that i feel like that's such a core of something that's held me back is you know yes we fear everybody talks about it. we fear judgment and you fear this mm -hmm. and that and doubt and i talk about it all the time <laughs> But the answer is just really being comfortable knowing that you putting yourself first isn't actually even that selfish because it'll pay like a better version of you is a, mm -hmm. is a, is a better gift to everyone. To everyone. Um, but uh, it seems like along the way you've, you have grown not only comfortable doing that, but it's, it's something that you do very well. It's, uh, I try to do it very well every, every single day. And, and I want to be very clear. I'm, I'm human. Like everybody else, I have all the doubts. It is, sometimes it is hard. Um, but it, you know, I've, I've learned that I can accomplish these things and I've seen it happen over and over again. It's hard for, for my mind to tell me it can't happen again. And that's where the, I think the differentiating factor is once you get through one obstacle, um, you realize you can overcome all obstacles and, uh, the key is just taking that massive imperfect action and getting through the first one. I was told when Don was booked for this podcast that it would be a BS free, real conversation with zero limits. And I think he delivered. So thank you, Don. Okay. Key takeaways for me. Number one, I love this so much. Act as if you're already who you want to become. So think about who you want to be and start acting as if you're already that person. Number two, if you want to be an entrepreneur, you must have tenacity. You must have a real drive because you're going to face obstacles. You're going to face challenges and you got to be able to push through them. And then number three, you must be willing to take massive action without worrying about making mistakes. I get hold of, I, I mean, I'm, I'm the worst at that. <sighs> Thank you, Don. Remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show the world, we can show ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen, but you have to think big. You've got to be bold and you must say yes. If you're ready for more inspiration, you have got to hear the story of how this man went from being homeless to being a multimillionaire and it was not easy. Click on the link right over there. I think habits are inherent, but choices are chosen. 
I did have to make the initial choice, which was the, yes, I'm going to do this, but I did regress several times. 